Hi and welcome to Terry Talks Movies. This time around we're doing the last of the alphabetical A to Z of the alphabet hidden gem movies which I've just described very badly. So I'm doing W, not X, Y and Z. Now I'm going to give you a couple of suggestions for X but I'm not going to go into details for them because I've talked about one of them on that channel before. Ah, yeah, it's been great going through it. I think it's got to have been at least 130 movies I've talked about in this series, and I'm not through yet. So let's get started with the W's. Now, this one is an indicated copy of a movie I wanted to have a copy of for a long time before I got it. Stars Godfrey Cambridge and Estelle Parsons. It's from 1970, directed by Melvin Van Peebles, who gave us Sweet Sweet Back's Badass Song, Watermelon Man which is about a white guy played by Godfrey Cambridge who wakes up one morning black and this causes him a lot of trouble in his middle class boring life he's an insurance guy which is a strike against him in the first place and he's sexist as hell he does bad dad jokes at the office he's just a pain in the ass and his life changes entirely because he becomes black it's a really dark satire on 1970 era conformity but it's a lot of fun as well. And Godfrey Cambridge, fantastic actor, died way too early. He is terrific as the main character, playing his arc from white middle class dude to basically black revolutionary. It's an interesting arc for the character. I like this. It says, the uppity movie. But it's hilariously funny. Yes, it is a satire based on the era in which it was made. And you've got to accept that. There's Godfrey Cambridge there. And uh, you get a booklet, and I love a booklet. Here's a bit of the promotional art for the movie. There's just so much good stuff about this. There's an interview with Melvin Van Peebles in this. I remember hearing about the movie long before I ever saw it. And it delivers. It is sharply satirical. And it shows the stupidity and the weaknesses of people who are racist. Melvin Van Peebles, directing legend, had to throw a watermelon man in this one because satires of previous generations tell us something about now. And you can use them as a yardstick to say how far we've come in certain social problems. Watermelon Man is one of those useful yardstick movies when we're talking about satirizing the things that are wrong with society. So I like that one. I watched it last year and enjoyed it all over again. It was a 1997 Australian movie, which has an American star in it because people did that kind of thing in the 20th century. So in this case, it's Jonathan Sage. But it's also got a good supporting cast of Australian actors, Susie Porter's in there, D Smart, and Rod Taylor playing Big Daddy. And it is Welcome to Whoop Whoop. And I know a lot of Australian people who hate this movie. But it's satirical as hell. It's set in a town which has technically been abandoned because of the asbestos mines that are there. But an extended group of people still live there and have created their own microcosm society even though of course mesothelioma and other asbestos diseases are in the air they've created a kind of crazy mirror maze quirky version of an australian society and rod taylor is great playing big daddy whose character goes from humorous and welcoming to totally menacing pivoting in an instant and it's probably one of the best late roles from rod taylor an actor whom i unashamedly adore and there's a scene where he tap dances on the bar with tap shoes that are electrified and you've got to see it for that there's some tremendous satire of rogers and hammerstein musicals it's a weird quirky odd film it's one that I think is, is very different from a lot of other Australian films. It takes a lot of the cliches of Australian outbreak life that we see in, in so many other films and flips them on their head and, and takes them in a totally different direction. It was directed by Stephen Elliott and I, I do have a fondness for it. Unfortunately, this version of it is in 4.3 aspect ratio. But I'm going to hunt around and find an upgrade to this one because it's an Australian movie I like and it's an Australian movie I want to keep in the collection. But that 4 to 3 aspect ratio really puts me off a little bit. Moving right along, we've got one of the best Vincent Price roles later in his career. Directed by Michael Reeves, Witch Finder General, where he plays Matthew Hopkins, a witch finder in uh, Puritan England, who basically uses his position for his own nefarious purposes. This is a full-on horror movie. It all co-stars Ian Ogilvy and Rupert Davis is in there. Wilfred Bramble 
from Stepto and Son is in there as well, and Patrick Weimark, who plays Oliver Cromwell. This one is very, very dark and very grim. And Vincent Price's Lettrous and Power Mad, which find a general, is a really interesting character in this one. And it's one of those roles where he doesn't get to use any of the cliches of stylized Vincent Price acting. There were times where Vincent Price would cash a check, like any other actor of his calibre, working in the kind of films he worked in. He shows his A-game, he shows his theatre training, he shows his skills, he shows that he's more than just a campy, cartoonish kind of character. And I like which fighter general for this one. It was also called The Conqueror Worm, which seems to be a worse name for it. Uh, this is the cinema cult version from here in Australia, which has no extras on it. But I'm okay with that. I'm okay with just enjoying the movie as the movie. If I want to look up more about it, I can do that. And this one was dead cheap on Blu-ray, so win-win. This one is a movie that I love for different reasons. It's a labour of love from people who had bugger all resources to make a film. They were in Uganda. They had about $200. The guy who made it, Isaac Nabwana, had a really old PC and really old editing gear. His PC was so old that he had to remove and wipe out his first film in order to edit this one on that computer. The special effects are rudimentary. The guns are basically wooden sticks. But there's a passion and a joy to this one, which makes it a movie that I love. And it's Who Killed Captain Alex, the first big Wakulliwood film from Ramon Pictures. It's great. And the other thing about it that makes it wonderful is it's got an English language VJ called VJ Emmy, who basically comments on the action as it's happening. And his commentary is fantastic. The movie is a love letter to film from people with incredibly low resources. It was filmed in a slum called Natite, just outside of the capital of Uganda, Kampala. And it was made with a lot of difficulty. When they had to do the blood stuff in the movie, they originally used cow blood until one of their actors caught brucellosis from it. <laughs> and they then chased over and tried to find something else to use as blood. The budget is a bit iffy. Some people say $200. Some people say $85 American. But this one I bought directly from Ramon Films. And it was, I've got a better version of it on Blu-ray, but I like this one because for a start, I've got an autograph from the director there, Isaac Nabwana. And if you have a look on the back, it's got the address for the production company. It was just burnt on a standard DVD. And the DVD is personalized to me. I also got a whole bunch of stickers and other things with this. And you're watching this video, so you love cinema. I actually got a comment from somebody who didn't love cinema but like the way I talked about it. Great. But for 99.9% .9 of you, you love cinema. And the passion and the love of cinema that Isaac Nabwana and his people did for Who Killed Captain Alex is heartwarming. There's something special about that thing that shows that Isaac Nabwana and the whole crew he had who love kung fu movies, who love action films, who like Rambo, who like all of that kind of stuff. I, we share a love with them. And... That makes the movie so much better for me. There is a sequel, Who Killed Captain Alex 2, which is in post-production now. And I definitely want a copy of that when it comes out. Supporting people who have such a strong passion for cinema and yet have really low resources to make the movies they want to make and to demonstrate their love for cinema. I want to really support them in every way I can. And if I have to save up my pennies and buy their movies when they come out, I'll definitely do that. So from there we move on to an American political satire directed by Richard Brooks, which is a bit hit and miss and which is tonally uh, quite odd. It's based on a novel called The Better Angels by Charles McCarry. And it's got a star-studded cast. We've got Sean Connery, Robert Conrad, George Grizzard, Hardy Kruger, Ron Moody, Leslie Nielsen, Catherine Ross, John Saxon, Henry Silver, Dean Stockwell, Robert Webber, and Rosalind Cash, and it's a movie called Wrong is Right, where Sean Connery plays an American television journalist called Patrick Hale, who gets involved with America starting wars in other countries, and starting wars with other countries because of the resources they want to give them. There's suicide bombers in this, there's a mad presidential candidate who is not bright and is over the top and is way out of his death, played by Leslie Nielsen. Not that that could ever happen in real life. It's set at a strident and kind of 
hectic pace and just keeps it there. In Australia, when this first came out, it was called The Man with the Deadly Lens, which is a bit of a stupid name. And for some reason, the version I've got here is a Dutch version from the Netherlands. I think I tried to find a copy of it, and this is the one I could get. But, uh, but it is satirical. It is fiercely critical of political systems across the world where people make the political decisions about other countries based on what they can rip them off for. It has some nice action sequences in it, and then it has some sequences that are a bit cringe. But I like it in spite of that. And I think that it's kind of a, an interesting moment in the career of Sean Connery. So Wrong is Right is worth checking out if you haven't. And again, it's, it's a product of the 1980s, and it does have a lot of the baggage of being that. Nonetheless, worth checking out. And Luna has turned up, but she's not going to come on camera because she doesn't want to come on camera. Do you, baby? You just want to be patted. Her tail is basically flicking my ass, so make of that what you will. Here we go to 1954 for an action programmer, which is kind of fun. It stars Jeff Chandler, Rhonda Fleming, and Mamie Van Doren. And it's called Yankee Pasha. Now, this one was put out by Umbrella not too long ago, and you can pick it up dead cheap from them. And it's based on a novel by a guy called Edison Marshall. And Jeff Chandler's character has the best name of any character in any movie. The character's name is Jason Starbuck. He falls in love with a beautiful woman called Roxanne, played by Rhonda Fleming, who is kidnapped by sea pirates and given to a sultan, played by Lee J. Cobb. Lee J. Cobb, a Jewish New York actor, playing a sultan. Not uncommon, because Jeff Chandler himself was Jewish. His real name was Ira Grossel. And this one is a lot of fun. It's not to be taken seriously at all. I used to watch this on Saturday afternoon matinees on television. And there was another movie with a similar name with Jeff Chandler, which was Yankee Buccaneer, but it's totally unrelated to this one. And Yankee Pasha is one of those movies that I like because I saw it when I was a kid. And I don't expect it to be great, but I expect it to be kind of entertaining. It's got a lot of beautiful women in it. It's got character actors acting up and acting at a high level in the sense that they're going a little bit over the top. And I always liked Jeff Chandler as an actor as well. Unfortunately, he died quite early in the early 1960s when he was getting back surgery and unfortunately hemorrhaged and basically bled out even though they gave him 52 pints of blood. But like what Jeff Chandler did, interesting actor who, unfortunately, his career ended early. I had to throw in a Kurosawa movie because he's the, he's the goat. And this one, of course, is in the two-pack that I got. I think I got it from Taiwan, if I recall correctly. But getting these two movies on DVD in a two-pack is a pretty good deal. And it's your Jimbo. One of the great samurai movies, because it was made by one of the great samurai movie directors. Toshiro Mifuni playing a ronin, a masterless samurai, who wanders into a little town. And the town is being taken over by a couple of warring gangs. And Mifuni's character, who says his name is Sanjuro, which means 30 years old, decides that he's going to take out the two gangs by playing them off against each other, pretending to be on the side of one gang and then setting them up for the other gang, and playing off the two until ultimately there's a showdown with the leader of one of the gangs, who has something very unusual for 1850s Japan. He has a pistol, whereas Sanjuro only has his swords and his wits. They have this showdown on a windswept street in the village, and it's played a lot like a lot of westerns from the 1950s, but elevated by Akira Kurosawa. The wind blowing across the street gives it a, a real dynamism, and the direction and the cutting, because Kurosawa cut his own movies, he didn't have an editor. And if you want to see a masterclass in cutting on action, you've got to watch the end of Yojimbo. And you've got to watch Sanjuro as well, because it's got one of the best last bits in it, of any samurai movie ever. This is a masterclass in why Akira Kurosawa was such a special director and how he lifted action cinema to a god tier level. And for me, it's one of my favorites of his work. Though there are, I do have a lot of them. Every time I see a new 
a Kira Kurosawa movie. I add one to my favorites. Your Jimbo is definitely one you should watch if you haven't already. It is 100% entertainment, beautifully shot, fantastically acted. The ensemble works fantastically well and incredibly memorable. Then we go to the movie that I watched last night, an Italian director. It's got a partly English language cast. Uh, Tisa Farrow's in it, who is the sister of Mia Farrow. Richard Johnson, uh, Ian McCulloch. And it's Zombie Flesh Eaters, Lucio Fulci's Zombie Flesh Eaters, which has some of the mankiest and most horrible zombies you can ever imagine. Again, this is an umbrella release on Blu-ray. This one starts out with an abandoned yacht blowing into New York Harbour, and the port authorities find a zombie on it. A young woman, played by Tisa Farrow, gets a journalist to help her go to the island where her father is supposed to be, and find out what happened to him. And unfortunately, the island is infested with zombies. And a doctor played by Richard Johnson is trying to treat the zombie outbreak as if it's a medical issue, where it's pretty clear, based on the subsequent events, that it's a supernatural issue. Now, the zombies in this one are kind of like that. They rise out of the grave, and there are worms coming out of their eyes. There's a real lot of blood and guts. There's exploding zombie heads, and when the zombie heads explode, it's kind of like a porcelain vase full of pomegranates. Really interesting film, and it's not really for anybody who's a bit tender in the stomach, but it is full on and works really well. The music's by Fabio Fritzi and Giorgio Tucci, and Fabio Fritzi was a long term collaborator with Lucio Fulci. A lot of markets, this is known as Zombies 2, because there is a previous zombie movie that Fulci did. But these Italian zombie movies of the 1980s are a lot of fun. It ends with zombies invading New York, so you've got to love that as well. Totally Mondo kind of film, totally midnight movie stuff, but I watched it yesterday afternoon. And had a really good time with it. I'm glad Umbrella put it out on Blu-ray, because it looks great. And you get every tiny detail of the worms crawling over the corpses and the giblets the corpses are eating out of the stomachs of beautiful women all that kind of stuff you get there recommended from me because i have vulgar taste at times nothing says playing a greek person like getting a mexican irish guy to do it but this movie was incredibly popular in the early 60s when it came out and probably helped greek tourism enormously it was directed by michael kakoyanis with wonderful music by mikas theodorakis Zorba the Greek with Anthony Quinn and Alan Bates. It's based on, on the island of Crete and a guy called Basil, who's a shy, inhibited writer from England, played by Alan Bates. I'm reading this off the back. He's befriended by Zorba, a boisterous, gregarious peasant with an astonishing love of life. And the bit that everybody remembers from Zorba the Greek is Anthony Quinn Zorba teaching Basil how to dance a sitaki, a traditional Greek dance on a beach, a pebbly beach. It's shot in black and white, beautiful widescreen, but it's one of those kind of life-affirming movies where the joyousness of the lead character and and the journey he takes Basil on is one of those kind of life-affirming bits of cinema that a lot of people like. And the music, Mikas Theodorakis' music in this is terrific. I got this for five bucks, and I consider that incredible value. I got the widescreen edition on this one, so I didn't bite the bullet and get a pen and scan on it. Uh, it's, it's interesting to just see a kind of multicultural movie from the 1960s, which embraces life and gives us a bit of a different story than the usual stuff that cinema put out for us in that era. Last one I've got for you is a Wusha movie. And one of the first I saw, I had this on VHS back in ancient times. It was directed by Choi Hark from 1983, so you know it's good. Zoo Warriors of the Magic Mountain. This is like Kung Fu, Buddhist magic action. There's a blood demon which is basically red silk draped over a rock and pulled by wires. But it's got tons of wire work, wuxia action. It uh, stars Yuan Biao, who plays a young soldier who's caught between two rival armies during the Tang Dynasty, taking sanctuary in a cave within the ominous Zoo Mountains. He becomes entangled in a battle with supernatural forces beyond his comprehension. you got to watch a movie based on that blurb. And there's a ton of extras on the Blu-ray, so you can contextualise 
the how cinema in Hong Kong was at the time and how the movie was made. Don't get a booklet, but you get a beautiful disc there. I love the artwork on that disc. But Zoo Warriors the Magic Mountain is, is terrific. But Zoo Warriors the Magic Mountain is terrific because it's dynamic action, wall to wall. It's crazy, it's over the top. It's got that thing where two wizards fly at each other across the sky. Um, just a lot of fun. And Choi Hark, fantastic action director, who has made any number of fantastic movies. You can go down the rabbit hole of his career and have a wonderful time for weeks and weeks. And for me, it's nostalgic because I did see it on VHS. It, was, it may even be in a slightly dodgy VHS that I got from somewhere like Polyester Records. Nonetheless, I'm glad I got a good quality copy of it. And it looks fantastic on Blu-ray. Really nice transfer from a really good original um, source material. So I've finished the A to Zs now. 13 or 14 weeks, I'm not sure. I'll just put it up here whether it's 13 or 14 weeks. But 10 movies in each of those weeks. And it just shows how much cinema there is out there to love. And how even if you know a lot of movies, there's always movies that you don't know that people like myself or like my audience as well will steer people in the direction of one of the things we do best is sharing our passions and sharing a passion for cinema is what the channel is about but it's also something i get back from the people who watch the videos so thank you to everybody for that and thank you to the channel members and the people who support the channel on patreon.com slash terry talks movies and to the people who just comment or even just watch the videos it means a lot to me it shows that cinema and physical media in particular is nowhere near dying as my friend heath holland over at serial at midnight has said anybody who tells you that physical media is dying is lying and so on that note thanks a lot for watching if you enjoyed the video please like subscribe leave a comment hit the notification bell i've already done the bit about the channel members and the patrons so i will continue the hidden gem series on mondays i really saw on sundays your time probably and Monday's my time because I've got some niches I want to explore as far as hidden gem movies are concerned so in the future each one's going to be this kind of movie hidden gem or this era or this culture movie hidden gem so I'm going to continue the series and until then watch some good movies watch some bad movies watch some movies you've never watched before from decades you weren't even alive in and I'll catch you next time